So last week, uh, Pastor Christensen uh, talked about what he would call, and I would agree for sure, uh, the most famous story of Elijah. Uh, And this week, we are uh, going to be working through the second most famous story. Now, whether you missed it or you don't remember, it's worth going back to what happened right before this. Uh, Elijah has this mountaintop experience, this high noon moment, as we called it, where he is in a showdown between himself and 450 prophets of a Canaanite god called Baal. Or as when we, when I was living in Texas, we'd call him Baal. But I'm going to just call him Baal. And, <clears throat> I mean, the story ends with all of those prophets being killed. And it's important to explain some of that background here, because uh, the point isn't this is how we deal with people who have a different religious opinion. We just kill them. That is not what this is about. Uh, Baal was a Canaanite fertility god. And I don't know if you know much about them, but that actually tells us quite a lot. Uh, At its worst, and this is definitely in the Bible, worship of a Canaanite fertility god means things like child sacrifice or required ritualistic uh, temple prostitution. Uh, This is a religious practice uh, that becomes dehumanizing very quickly. And because uh, the prophet Elijah was called to shepherd the people of Israel, uh, he had to remove this cancer because it was spreading throughout the people and it was going to cost them their lives in many different ways. So he has this showdown. They they arrange these altars and um, the prophets of Baal get to go first. And Elijah says something interesting. He says, you are 450 and I am only one. We'll hold that thought for just a second. And so the, the prophets of Baal, they pray and nothing happens. And then Elijah gets up, prays kind of in a nonchalant way, and fire comes down and consumes uh, the altar. A- and then it shows that the God of Israel is the one true God and that the prophets of Baal, uh, they need to be killed lest that cancer spreads throughout Israel. Uh, but we're talking about running on empty. And as you notice from the reading, Uh, Elijah crashes hard after this. And I think at least part of that has to do with the fact that he had said, you guys are 450 of you, and there is only one of me. If you are alone and isolated, you will hit burnout really fast. It is not how people were intended to live. So anyway, uh, as you can imagine, uh, Jezebel, the, the queen who uh, really, really liked, she was like the, the patron for the Baal prophet, she was not happy, and orders uh, Elijah killed. And so he, like you do, gets out of town. And so he's, you know, running, he's going to find some sort of safety, and he crashes underneath a broom tree. Uh, I forgot to look up what exactly that is, but the image in my mind is hysterical. So, you know, so he's laying there, and he's like, I'm just, and he prays to God, like, I'm done, just kill me. Now, Elijah does not strike me as kind of the the person with this weird flair for the dramatic, like, oh, my life is over, I'm going to die. And it's like, dude, your girlfriend just broke up with you, you're going to be fine. No, this, this is Elijah at his darkest moment. He's like... I I am done. He is alone. He has this huge, miraculous, high mountain moment, and it almost costs his life, and now he's laying there alone. And so God uh, sends this angel and this vision, and he wakes up, and there's food prepared for him, which is like awesome room service. And he says, go and eat. So he does, and then he falls back asleep, kind of still like, oh, just kill me. Uh, and then he wakes up, and they says, go and eat, for the journey is too great for you. In other words, he's got to build his strength. So he then travels to Mount Horeb. And Mount Horeb has a different name. It's actually Mount Sinai. This is the mountain. This is the place where God gave his commandments to Moses to give to the Israelites. After he rescued them from slavery in Egypt, he founds the people of Israel. They become a nation at that moment, in that place. And there is Elijah at this, this holiest of sights. And God asks him, what are you doing? 
And he says, and he says it twice, every time God asks him, he says, I have been very zealous for you. I have given everything. I'm kind of interpreting what he's saying. He's, he's, he's gone. He's done what he, God has asked. He has spoken truth to power. He has fought power with power. He has used violence when it, it was needed most. Because sometimes to bring justice, your hands have to get bloody. And, and here he is alone. People are after him to kill him. And, and he, he's like, I've got nothing left. He is empty running on empty, or as we would say, he is burnt out. Now, burnout is a very uh, broad, kind of complicated experience. We will all go through burnout in our lives at some point. So there's no way I'll be able to talk about all the different facets of burnout. But there are a couple of uh, ways that burnout happens that I think uh, will help us understand what's going on with Elijah. The first is that burnout will happen if you are giving of yourself to something or someone, but then at the same time, you are not receiving something. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to mean like you give uh, to somebody and then they give back in return. But if nothing is filling you up, giving you energy, giving you inspiration to keep doing something, and yet you are giving your time and your energy and resources— then you will eventually empty out. You will run out of energy. Uh, imagine uh, like a, um, a, uh, uh, somebody who works for a nonprofit. Nonprofits do not pay well because the idea is that you work for a nonprofit uh, because you're, you, you've bought into the cause, that this is something that is valuable that need, and that needs to happen. Say uh, somebody who works for a, a, a cancer research organization raising money for uh, re, uh, oncology research. And, and this is, you know, this is an important thing, and you are doing it because you value this sort of research. You are making a difference in the world. That is what fills you up. Not the compensation. <laughs> the, the long hours could wear you down, but you have bought into this vision. But if at any point you start losing that, start becoming cynical about the process, things don't work quite like they probably should, at least so you think, you'll find that you start giving more and more than you're actually receiving, and you will burn out. That is one way that burnout can happen. And the other way is, is closely related. If you are giving and giving and giving, and you see no difference being made, you will also burn out. Because the things that we do, and this could be in our relationship, in our marriages, in our work life, in our home life with our kids, in our communities, uh, as a nation, in our church communities as well. We are giving our time and our resources. We are doing things uh, that God has asked us to do, and yet nothing changes. That's going to become a very big problem. You cannot sustain that. The, the, the best example or the easiest example that I could think of uh, is uh, like a, a couple that just had their first child. If you've ever like had a newborn, you know those first like two months are awful because you've got this child and you've got this instant bond and yet this child is quite literally the world's perfect narcissist. There's nothing that exists outside of its own discomfort. It's just screaming. It can give you nothing back. The only thing it will do in response is like vomit on you or something like that. And, and yet, you know, it's, it needs to be fed and changed every couple of hours at, at least, if not more. And it just requires so much time and energy. And you can tell, like, new parents, when they're kind of hitting that burnout moment, uh, which you've got to keep going on or they'll arrest you. And you, you're, you're just exhausted. <laughs> and, and because the kid gives nothing back, you're just giving and spending. Nothing is really changing all that much. It's not giving you back anything. And then as our doctor, when my wife and I had our first kid, said, then you hit about late month number two, or month two, uh, early month three, the kid smiles back at you. And you realize, in, in his words, then you're actually not going to flush him down the toilet. <laughs> it's funny, but there's profound truth to that. You give and you give and you give, and then Finally, 
There's that response that just fills you up. It energizes you. You realize, hey, you know, I can do this. But Elijah is at this moment where he has spent his career speaking truth to power, fighting power in the name of God with power. And yet, it hasn't helped. As he says twice, yet Israel still is going after Baal. That is still engaging in these really dark, by the way, uh, worship practices. It is still killing, poisoning itself uh, spiritually and physically. And so then, after he says this, God says, I am passing by. And this is the part that makes this famous. There's like a, a, a rushing wind and an earthquake and, a, and lightning or fire, and I'm getting those out of order, and it's all good. Uh, and, and Elijah notices that God is not in either of those big, powerful demonstrations. And then there is a quiet whisper, and Elijah hears him. So he gets up, and God asks again, Elijah, what are you doing? He says, I have been very zealous. I have fought hard. I have done what you have asked me. And yet nothing has changed. That is burnout. That is empty. That is, I have nothing left to give these people. And then God's response is very interesting. He says, okay, anoint that guy king over there, anoint that guy, king over there, anoint your successor, Elisha. Go and do that. And it says that, that basically God is going to approach this problem from politics. And he says, your, your successor, like, he'll also, you know, take the sword to the people that the other two get. And I think there's more rhetoric there than anything, because Elisha was not violent. He doesn't have that zeal, that use of power that Elijah does. And as I was struggling to kind of make sense of all of this, I came across the those writings of a, a modern rabbi named Jonathan Sachs, a British rabbi. And he noticed that the, the, the first demonstrations or possibilities of God's presence when he is on Mount, when Elijah is on Mount Horeb, the, the thunder and, and the wind and the earthquakes, those all represent Elijah. Like, Elijah is that fiery prophet, the one who will speak uh, truth to power, will fight power with power, uh, that, that he will do what needs to be done. And yet God isn't there anymore. God is in the quiet whisper. And as this rabbi points out, that is indicative of Elisha. Elisha was not a violent prophet. He lived through violent times. He was much more compassionate than Elijah. A lot more gentle. A little more like a shepherd. And this leads, leads us to realize that sometimes, not always, but sometimes, uh, when we burn out, when we find ourselves running on empty, we've got nothing left to give our, our spouses or our children, our job, our community, our church, and like things are just not changing. We are trying so hard to do what God has called us to do, and we are, we are burning out sometimes, like with Elijah— it means that God is doing something different now. Because for Elijah, when Elijah takes a step back and he doesn't die, he is taken up into heaven in front of Elisha, it symbolizes that God through his prophets is going to do things differently. That although it was at the time it was perfectly appropriate for Elijah to fight power with power, to be zealous for God. That zeal and fighting power with power, that clutching and grasping and grinding to accomplish what God has called you to do, can't sustain itself. 
the really high energy, uh, high, um, high power people, most of the time will eventually wear down. You can't stay there. And God is not just a God of power. God is a God of compassion too. And so when Elijah hits his burnout moment, I think it's because it is time that God calls another prophet to do things differently. And I think the same is true for us. When we slam against a wall, or we are beating against the door over and over, desperate for, for change, for things to happen, uh, for, to, to continue to do what God has called us to do, maybe that indicates that God has something else in mind. He is going to be doing things differently. Now, when you talk about Elijah, you can also just as easily talk about John the Baptist. As I said, and we'll talk about this in two weeks, I think, uh, that, that Elijah does not die. He is taken up in front of Elisha by these chariots of Israel. And in kind of a cool scene, Elisha clings to Elijah, uh, and Elijah says, what do you want as I leave? And he says, give me an extra measure of your spirit. And Elijah, you can tell, he's like, oh, I don't know if you want that. Uh, but he gets it. And he's taken up, and, and a later prophet, Malachi, or as I like to say, the only Italian prophet, Malachi, uh, points out that Elijah's coming back, and he will be the one that prepares the way and heralds that, that God has come and he is doing something new. His rescue is coming. He will save his people from the things that come to crush them, including themselves. And lo and behold, John the Baptist, the, the, the prophecy over his life, and, and really the way he lived out his career, is that he is that voice like Elijah preparing the way. And if you kind of read it, what he does in context, he is an old school, Old Testament prophet. Like wearing camel hair and living in the wilderness. And, and people come and, and to, to be baptized by him, and he's saying, you brood of vipers. Who told you to flee from the coming wrath? Like, he is Elijah embodied. He gets thrown in prison because he mouths off to King Herod. Uh, because King Herod was with, quote-unquote, uh, his brother's wife. And he's like, that is not kosher. If you want to be a true king of the Jews, you can't. And so for his trouble, he gets imprisoned. And political intrigue, get, intrigue gets his head cut off. He is Elijah, that speaking the truth to power fighting power with power, that zeal that is necessary sometimes, but can't be sustained. And if Elisha, a prophet of compassion who does something very different from Elijah, succeeds Elijah, then we can also draw the parallel that Jesus succeeds John the Baptist. And it seems to be one of the things that the Gospels hint at. Because there's this heartbreaking moment when John is in prison. And he sends his disciples there to Jesus, who is now well into his career. And they say, are you the one who's supposed to come? In other words, you're doing things differently. This is not what we expected. Because rather than Jesus fighting power with power, he fights power by yielding it. But rather than attacking the people who are doing wrong, he goes and heals and brings wholeness to the people who are wronged. The, the poor, the broken, physically and spiritually. That in the moment when he's going to his death, he could at any time, and he says this, call down an army of angels. And yet rather than holding and grasping to power, he lets go. Because God is doing something new, something different. That sometimes when we burn out, we're maybe grabbing onto the wrong thing. Or, or, or at least we are grabbing onto something in the wrong way. We are trusting God for a certain outcome without realizing that maybe God has something else in mind. Now, based on some of the broad examples I have used, please don't hear me say, leave your wife, quit your job, and stop going to church. It's not what I'm saying. 
But maybe sometimes, instead of demanding to be heard, this is God calling you to listen. In your job, your career, maybe instead of grabbing on to this dream of you getting your slice of the pie, God has something else in mind. That maybe in your family life, that maybe it's okay if things don't happen exactly how you think they should, even though you're convinced that's the right way. That when we keep running against these walls and we find ourselves burning out, running on empty, this can often be the fact that God is telling you that maybe it's time to let go. Maybe he is changing the situation. Maybe he wants to do things in a different way. Maybe it's time to let that dream die. Because wherever God kills, God also makes alive. And just like Elisha succeeds Elijah in a much more compassionate, soft, gentler way, and Jesus takes that to the max as he succeeds John the Baptist, and rather than fighting power with power, he fights it by yielding it, giving of himself that maybe the call of Elijah, as Elisha is his successor, the lesson of Elijah is he is burning out on top of Mount Sinai, that it is time for God to do something different. I pray that we all have the courage to recognize when God is calling us into a new way of being that God is moving us beyond our grasping, our zeal, our intensity. That by his spirit, we let go. We let things die when they need to die because God always resurrects. We give of ourselves sacrificially to those who need it because God, by his spirit, will always fill us up. Let's pray.